Good evening. Thank you for coming, even uh, if the uh, even in, when the weather is so bad and doesn't look very uh, beautiful out there. So, do you mind if we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together, come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the life of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of the faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is right, and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Very good. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Do you mind if I... No, you okay. I talk with my legs and feet. <laughs> so if I kick this thing down, pardon me, so... <laughs> Try to keep your hand out from behind the screen or it'll disappear in the video. Oh. Because he replaces that with a, <laughs> your slide. So. Okay. No, so, no, no. You want to be away from the screen. Away from the screen? There you go. Do I look good on TV? <laughs> <laughs> Good. So this, um, as it was announced, we are going to navigate through Catholic social teaching. What is it? You'll be surprised that you already know the things I'm going to talk about. Yes, you already know them. But that, uh, I'm going to present them in a more systematic way so that you can see where every part falls. So there will not be anything new here. Well, a few things that are new and the way I've organized it. So what we talk about is quite um, very common. Now, to begin with, there is a short video that I would like all of us to watch about Catholic social teaching and how living our liturgical life and what we receive spans out in all areas of life, in everything. Even driving on the highway when you're tired. <laughs> yes. Okay. I have decided to represent the principles or the um, themes of Catholic social teaching in a different way. Of just And there's one that is missing on that video. So that I was going to touch on. And you will realize all the things you already know. But only that we, they have not been presented the way they, they have here in the video. Or even many of us have not heard about Catholic social teaching. How, what is the contribution of the Catholic Church's belief and faith to society? So, just a, just a definition you, you may uh, realize is... Uh, it's an area of Catholic doctrine based on, the, uh, based on and inseparable from understand, understanding of the human dignity. So every person is created in image and likeness of God and redeemed by Christ. Every person has, from conception to your death, has inalienable, what do you call inherent, inherent dignity. So that dignity is granted by God. It's not something that a society can give or any um, or nation. So, in consistent with that dignity, so every person should be accorded with the means to flourish. So, as you heard the presenters, it will not, it's not just for, for Catholics. How best can we be humane in the world? And we realize we re, re, you realize the gospel they quoted Matthew 25 of verse 31 to 46 was today's gospel, remember? And that gospel does not discriminate against, you know, these are for the Christians only. No. When the <coughs> universal judge appears, this is the way he's going to judge all nations. That means all persons. How best, how hum humane we we'll wear to other people, you know. So I'm going to present just the, the seven principles or 
themes of Catholic social teaching. And since these things are very common to us, only that we are presenting them in a more systematic way, organized way, I'll ask you for examples, because you know these things better than I do. <laughs> the one thing that they focused on was the life and dignity of the human person. That is the, the source of all the teaching, all the others. The second call to family, community, and participation. The third, rights and responsibilities. Fourth, option for the poor and vulnerable. Fifth, this dignity of work and the rights of workers. They touch it a little bit, you know, but not quite. Solidarity. What does it mean? And care for God's creation. So there are the seven principles of Catholic social teaching. What is our responsibility to the rest of the world? So let's begin number one. Now, as we mentioned, uh, the source and origin of Catholic social teaching is that all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Now, if you don't know how God looks like, just look at me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the, the foundation of the moral vision of the world, the way we relate to one another, all the things we do derive from the sacredness of the human person. That is the center. So, people in the Catholic social teaching, people are more important than things. We'll touch on that when we come to the economics, you know, where people are commodified, just the tools of production, you know. And so the measure of every institution is whether or not it either threatens or enhances the, the human life and human dignity. That's the bottom line. So this is not just, as the presenters uh, mentioned, it's not just about the Catholics, everybody. How best can we be humane to one another? So you realize that since the focus is the dignity of human person and human life, they're things that provide the human person the environment in which to flourish. Right? For example, a call to family. I don't follow this, but this is just for you. I'm just, you know. <laughs> Every person has a right to a family. You know, that's why as the central institutions of every society, the family must be protected. Children, their parents, everybody. That's the basic unit of society. I don't think any person would um, uh, fight against that. Oh no, we need to destroy the family. No, that's the most basic for every society. It doesn't matter which culture or, or religion or what, it's the family. So anything that, in, in other words, every society has to be organized, whether it's politics, it's public policy, it's economics, it's law, laws must protect the human dignity and capacity for individuals to grow in relation, relationship to one another. Very basic stuff, you know? So, because we live in a community, people have a right and duty to participate in society, seeking the common good and well-being of, of all people, especially the most vulnerable and the poor. Now, you notice um, the, here we have to underline the fact that we are not products of ourselves. Nobody brought themselves into this world. We all come from some family, somebody. We're all nurtured by some community. Even if 
individualism, which has been uh, uh, every Catholic church, I mean, every Catholic church teaching talks, speaks against individualism, which literally means selfishness, self selfishness on a grand scale, militates or fights against the idea that I am not my own creator, I'm not my own maker. I came into this world because somebody else loved me and brought me into this world. And I've not been nurtured by myself, but rather by that family, by the community, by everything else. So, yes, I have a right to live, I have a right to all the things, but also I have a duty and a responsibility, responsibility towards that community, that family, that society that nurtured me. So, as, as much as we have a right to belong to a family, community, but we also have responsibility towards that family, that community. So that's why we, in organizing society, we have um, civil responsibilities, you know, to participate in political life. We say, oh, I'm a Catholic, I don't vote. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a moral duty for every Catholic to vote. Because that's the way you bring about change in society. That's the way you participate in society. And uh, also there was a, a principle they never talked about. It's called the principle of subsidiarity. As much as we want to create society and community and government, which is part of the extension of a bigger society, there is a principle called subsidiarity. What does it mean? It means that the scope and limits of government must be limited. I mean, the, the government's involvement within private and small communities must be limited in such a way that the government only takes those initiatives that private or small communities are not able to do for themselves. For instance, you can say, oh, we people of Cold Spring need a, a, a highway here, freeway, you know? Let's build it. We don't have the capacity to do it, but we need it. So the bigger uh, community, society, is able to do that. But you don't want that the federal government to determine how you loan your yard in the back. No. Leave that to me. So subsidiarity as, uh, as a principle is as much intervention as needed and as less, what is it called? As less as unneeded, I think. So you only have as much as you want the bigger society to be involved in your life, and uh, the rest, uh, small communities can take care of it. So, um, the third principle is rights and responsibilities. I think the presenters have talked about this, that human digging can be protected and a healthy community achieved only if and when human rights are protected and responsibilities met. You see, here you see the rights and responsibilities come together. It's not just what is owed to me, but what do I owe to others? You know, so every person has a fundamental right to life. We have mentioned that and right to those things that are required for human decency. House. Um, Health care, education, water, things that, you know, um, help the human person to flourish. And uh, so I've already mentioned the, uh, that corresponding to these rights, we have also duties and responsibilities towards others. So it's not just me, 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 myself and I, but also for others, to family, to one another in society. Now, there is this big one and it has been underlined by the presenters the preferential option for the poor and the most vulnerable in a world marred by uh, deepening divisions and widening gaps between the rich and the poor 
Catholic social teaching instructs. Now, this is not we ask, but it instructs us to put the needs of the poor and most vulnerable people first. Suppose your rich neighbor asks you to join them at potluck dinner, you know. But there's also a family that's starving next door. Catholic social teaching requires, forget about the dinner with your rich neighbor. Get that food, feed the, the hungry neighbor. That's his responsibility, you know. So love for the poor has another step. It has the promotion of justice. It's not just about charity, handouts. You know, oh, you, 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 know, you need clothing, I'll give you a shirt, okay. But also to try to challenge those social structures that create poverty in the first place. What are those structures in society that are unjust? that create poverty, because poverty sometimes is created by, you know, the widening gap between the rich who take everything, and there's nothing left for the majority of people. So what are those structures? So for the Catholics, they, are, they ought to challenge those, those structures in society that create poverty in the first place. So the obligation to provide justice for all means that the poor have the single most urgent claim to the conscience of society so we don't pass them by and say, uh oh, I don't care about you. No. So the active justice uh, that fights or challenges the social structures should be able to empower the poor so that they become active agents of their own uh, um, uh, lives, you know, you provide them the conditions and help them to become um, uh, active participants in society. And this is the that the second last point is one of the um, uh, people might feel uncomfortable with that persons in extreme necessity are entitled to take what they need, now the key word here, need, from the riches of others. When you're hungry and you have no food, you can go to the store and take the food and eat it. Not to sell it. I know, it sounds crazy. At time of war, that is extreme, you can go into any field and take what you need and cook for your family. Human life first. Remember the, um, the basic principle is dig into the human person and human life. Not to break into a Gucci store and take the bags. <laughs> no. Life first. Health. So I don't mean to say if you're sick, just go into... Uh, walls green and say, oh, oh, I need this medicine. <laughs> You've been in trouble. But this is, this is allowed. The Catholic Church says, you take it. You go eat. And uh, so the bottom line is the basic moral test of every community, society, and nation is how its most vulnerable members are flourishing. And that applies to people too. The way you know the character of a person is the way they treat people below them. The little ones, the most vulnerable. When you know the character of a society, the way it treats its most vulnerable members. The way you know the character of a nation is just look at the poor. Just look at the most vulnerable. And then you know the character of the society. So, um, the fifth is a dignity of work and rights of workers. The economy is not to serve, the economy is meant to serve human beings, but not the other way around. 
in neoliberal um, capitalism, everybody is a commodity. You know, you're only a tool for production. That's why in the, um, you remember the, in the 17th century and 18th century, there was a revolt, there was capitalism after the Industrial Revolution and then came communism and the argument, I'm not arguing for any of them, the argument was in capitalism, when you work for somebody, that employer makes sure that you produce way much more than they give you. Have you noticed that? If, for example, you work, say, $5 an hour, the work you put in an hour must be more than $5 an hour. Otherwise, they wouldn't make any profit. Isn't that correct? Otherwise, the whole thing would collapse. So you might be making $50 an hour, but you're given, say, 10 or 15 and in the end, at the end of the year, the employer accumulates all this profit by giving the, employer, the employees just a basic minimum or uh, salary for living, wages. Okay? So, the workers are treated just like tools. In those days when... Um, so capitalism rose and then came communism said, no, let the government take over. Nobody owns anything. And then there was a middle way. I'm just, I'm not an economist. I'm just showing you how this whole thing um, came about. The, the first encyclical that Pope Leo XIII wrote was the rise and dignity of, of, of human work, human labor about the new things, the new developments. And the middle way was, okay, we can have capitalism, but you have to share the profits with the, with the, uh, with the people who contribute to that production. You know, if Mr. Clock is my boss, you know, he gives me $2 an hour and I work my butt off. At the end of the year, he has made millions, and then for me, I'm just, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. You know, and the middle will say, no, take that millions, those millions of profit, and then distribute them among the people who have contributed to that profit. So there was a middle way that the church suggested. I will show you a little book that I brought, if you could... Um, yes, it's called Living Justice. Oh, thank you. Um, Living Justice, Catholic Social Teaching. It will be fair and just not to make excessive profit on the backs of people, but to have a way of sharing that to which they have contributed. But of course, ne neoliberal um, capitalism doesn't want it. That's why we you know here today people talk about all oh, the, the widening gap between the rich and the poor. These are some of the issues the church really talks about. So, um, so and work is not just a way to make a living. We go to work and oh, I, but also a continuing and a participation of God's creation. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. God had made human beings in his own image and then gave the whole creation to, um, to the human beings to subdue the, the animals and everybody, everything. So he handed it over. But that's a responsibility, you know. If the dignity of work is to be protected, the best rights of, wor uh, of works, workers, sorry, must be respected. The right to productive work, don't just use them paycheck to paycheck, to decent and fair wages, you know? Can they save for the future? Can they afford, you know? To organization and joining unions, you know, in some countries this is prohibited, you can't do it. Because those who have big money control even the policies in the world, you know? To private property and economic initiatives, you know, people should be able to have private, private property should be 
a right and even you know having your own a house and nobody will take it you know the, the government doesn't say um you and your family you live here we want that house no it's mine and you have a right over it so the sixth and second last one the virtue of solidarity am i my brother's keeper how many minutes Okay, <laughs> when I see Vicky looking at her watch, I say, uh oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so we are one human family. Whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and theological differences, we are our sisters and brothers, keepers, whatever they may be. Remember, the bottom line is digging into human life and digging over the person. So loving our neighbor has a global dimension in this world which is coming closer and closer. That's why we are Catholic, universal. It doesn't matter whether someone lives in, in Louisville. Is that the furthest place in Kentucky? Or <laughs> 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 <All> anywhere. So <laughs> they're all, we're all one human family. So the core of the virtue of solidarity is the fundamental pursuit of justice and peace for all people in the world. That's why we pray for people everywhere. Peace in Ukraine, in um, wherever it might be. They're all um, part of us. So uh, this also involves uh, peaceful means to promote peaceful means to end conflicts and violence. So... Uh, we are truly Catholic when we are concerned for our brothers and sisters everywhere. And the last one, uh-oh, it's not moving. <laughs> oh, there we go. So God is creation. We honor our creator by our good stewardship of creation. Care for the environment is a moral duty. As I mentioned, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, God gave us this creation and we ought to protect it. Just imagine when we were teenagers and then your parent left you his car. They went off for you know, a trip or went somewhere to visit family. They don't want to come back when you've wrecked the car. <laughs> you know, you don't want that to happen. I know some kids do it. They go for a spin, and guess what? It becomes a roar. <laughs> so this is the same thing. God gave us this creation. We must take care of it. Not to destroy it, you know. And uh, we have the obligation to bequeath to the future generations a planet that can be livable, can live there. You don't want to live it poisoned and polluted and destroyed. That's being irresponsible. Because their worth demands that we are responsible for the earth. Not to destroy the lakes and rivers and the, the atmosphere because of our greed. Oh, we want production, we want to be happy, we want everything for ourselves as if we're the first and the last human beings on the planet. No, God gave it to us so we take care of it, so that the future generations might find it a place to live and enjoy, not have all kinds of diseases and, you know, they have to fight. So this is our responsibility. Remember, Catholic social teaching goes outwards. Not so much me, myself, and I, but my duties and responsibility for somebody else, you know? So the environment, you know, when uh, we care for the environment, uh, it's our moral and ethical duty. We cannot ignore it. As I mentioned, all the things you already know. It's nothing new. I just organized them a little bit different from the way they were presented in the video. And, uh, um, oh, did I click something? It takes me long to learn anything. So this is just the easy guide to Catholic social teaching, you know? We mentioned the human dignity is on top, everything. Everyone is special, everybody. Common good, what is good for everybody? Not just me, myself, and I, that unholy trinity. Solidarity, we are one big family, you know? 
uh, subsidiarity, all people should have a say, not just one giant organization that de <coughs> determines everything. A participation, we all want to work and contribute to our communities, care for our common home. We are part of a need to care for creation, a preferential option for the poor. Some people need extra help. Okay. Now, I have not gone in detail whatsoever in every uh, point here. I didn't. So I just want to open. How many minutes do we have so that we can open up? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, good for our conversation. So that if you have any questions, something to contribute, we can you know, use this just to look at them. Um, any questions about these points? If only we can follow them. I know, yes. <laughs> whatever it is. A couple weeks ago they had something on about um, a business and their goal is to to um, support businesses that are opening and have the um, workers be the owners and the profits and share. So it's happening again someplace. Oh, that's wonderful. That sounded, it sounded great. <clears throat> there is a Catholic bank that I read about I don't remember which country. They actually do that. So what they do is they look at the profits they have made in the year and then be, you know, save some and then the rest as some, uh, some percentage. They distribute everything um, among all people equally. Doesn't mean the CEO is going to take more than the person who, who takes out the trash. No. They share it equally. I thought that was a, a wonderful thing, but of course, in the more new liberal uh, economics and capitalism, it's the boss that takes everything, you know? So, beautiful. Yes, JJ. So where do these fit into our Catholic beliefs? Meaning, are these something that we just believe? Are there something that we can disagree with? Um, where does this fit? Because there are certain things that I saw there that I'm not 100 percent fully in. I believe in. Mm. But where where does this fit into our faith? Can you give an, the example you mentioned um, um, of something you don't agree with? So there is definitely. You were talking about the poor earlier. That is definitely something we should do. But not everybody wants to participate. Hmm. So, where does this fit into if someone just doesn't want help? Hmm. And that's just that. that is, where does our belief stop hmm. and say we just can't say, we can't solve everything? Yeah, this is an offer. Remember, yeah. it's an offer. offer. Yes. This is what the church is offering to the world, how to live practically in a humane and human and humane world. Now, not everybody will take the offer. Some people reject it. They don't have to, to accept or to, uh, if you come to the um, feeding the poor and say, oh, I don't want you to get into my little house, go away. That's their choice. But you have to make the offer. You can't force it on anybody. And of course, there are many people who do not agree with also, in another point, with the economic, um, the, the church does not suggest a particular economic system, but it challenges the excesses of either capitalism or communism. Either you own everything or private, without uh, the, 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 I'm not a, a, an economist, but what I understand, uh, communism, the government owns everything. So yes. Everything. You have no right to private property, nothing. And capitalism, I mean, it, it wants everything to the people and no government intervention. You know? 
both of them have problems. What's the middle way we can go? You know, since we have responsibility over one and one uh, each other, you know. So there are many um, disagreements about all the things, you know. So we can. Oh, I'm sorry. May I respond to that? Yeah. As I mentioned, we just stated the principles. There are documents upon documents that touch on every issue I've mentioned. So only here we just, we, have no, we don't have time. Even one principle, we could take a whole year talking about it. Because there's so many issues that are involved in the protection of human dignity and human life. So what I would recommend to is, this little book is an introduction by Father Thomas Masalo, he's a Jesuit. He taught at Boston College. He, um, he has written excellently about um, Catholic social teaching. And some of the issues you mentioned are actually here. Do you mind if I lend it to you? <laughs> For 50 bucks? <laughs> yes, and <laughs> making profit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these are the principles that there are so many documents I didn't mention, even the documents that have been written about since 1891, when Pope Leo XIII wrote the first encyclical. There have been so many encyclicals that have been written, paper documents, and so many teachings about each of these principles. 
we just didn't have the time to go through them. But the things you touch on, right there. Yes. I have a list of those that I'll put in the follow-up resources in the email. I have a whole list of all those that we use for RCIA. So yes. I'll send that out if anyone wants to read up more on, you know, more in depth on church teaching. On e campus. Exactly. Yes. Everything you mentioned, the church has, has said something about it. Even when you go to the website of the uh, UCCB, mm -hmm. it's there. Very good. But thank you so much. There was a hand somewhere. Oh, well, I read his mind when they first said, well, what if someone just doesn't want to do any of that? Mm -hmm. Well, then you wind up on the left side. So when the time comes, if you want to be one of them that they say, go. Yes. You're not welcome. Well, why? Well, you never fed me. You never clothed me. Mm -hmm. You never came and visited me. That's the side. So you're right. No one has to do any of this. Mm -hmm. But where do you want to be at the end of time? In your heart? You know, where do you and where do you want your family? You want to help get them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Nobody has to do anything. Yeah. Roxanne, too, yeah. and I like, I like the one sentence. Start with just helping one person at a time. At a time. You can't yeah. go out there maybe and correct the whole world. It's, it's a mess right now, I think. And yes. Let's start with one. Mm -hmm. That person that's right in front of you, that was always what Mother Teresa did. That yes. Just focus on that person in front of you. Yes. And I think my first point about it was the first of the, uh, the life and dignity of a human person. I mean, we have to look at our society and see that we are a culture of death. So it's very easy, like with regards to environments, it's very easy to look at somebody and not see God in them and shoot them. You know, I, I think our did we value in our culture. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, if, if we can teach and live that life and dignity of a human person, it's, you're not so quick. Mm, you're right. <clears throat> and in addition to that, that's very really beautiful. In addition to that, you know, we could talk about this forever. We have to watch the things we believe about people. Because the way we think is the way we act. Because we, um, as human beings, can begin to embrace or, um, I ideas that either criminalize or demonize a particular groups of people. And the ones that have been dehumanized, it's easy to destroy them. So we didn't have a chance to talk about that. What are the ideologies in the modern world that um, demonize certain groups of people? That's easy to say, oh, well, after all, he's, um, or her, we can get rid of them. You see? So the way we think can insulate the way, I mean, it can um, it affects the way we act. And that's very important. That's why when we start Mass, uh, we, we, when we do the Kim Fritao, um, uh, the way we think, our mind, our words and actions matter. You see? And yeah. what I fail to do. And oh, yes, omissions. So a lot of times, <coughs> the what I, I fail to do exactly. falls under some of these. Exactly. Need right in front of you. You're very right, yes. So, any other ideas? I just, I just think, like, uh, I don't know, for myself, you know, we watch this and and it all makes sense. You know, I don't think anybody's sitting here disagreeing with, you know, a lot of the theory and the concepts. You know, it gets where it gets really hard is when we, when we go, when we got to make those decisions and it's, you know, and we struggle, I think a lot of us struggle with, well, what, how much am I expected to get? You know, how much is enough for me to kind of save for security versus helping those in need? And, mm -hmm. and I know for me, like one of the biggest things, traps that I fall into are, <clears throat> you, know, you drive around town and you see all these mansions, these huge million, millions of dollars, you know, homes. And you think, that is such excess. Why do these people need to live like that? But then, you know, I think, well, there's probably a lot of people who uh, maybe they, they don't drive by our neighborhood because they don't have a car. <laughs> but if somebody did walk by, you know, where most of us live, they they think probably the same thing. <laughs> you know, wow, that's that's excess. You know? Exactly. And so it just gets really hard in uh, trying to figure out that. Yeah, you're putting that up. How much is enough? Yeah, you bring out a beautiful point. What might be 
basic for you might be luxury for somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's why it's, I mean, that's, to me, what do you teach a kid? What do you teach a kid? Hmm. Never point your finger. Hmm. You point one finger at you. I just said that to my little granddaughter today. How hmm. many am I pointing at myself? What am I doing? Hmm. I cannot be worried about how big a house you live in. Mm-hmm. What am I doing with the house that I'm living in? Because it's too easy to look out. Mm-hmm. To say what yeah. you're not doing, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. And it's that one thing that she mentioned over there. Well, about, about doing one thing. You don't think one thing matters. Mm-hmm. One thing really matters. Mm-hmm. It can really make a difference in somebody's <clears throat> life as to whether they go this way or they go that way. It can really matter. Correct. So, Yeah, we are stewards of others, you know. And also, we didn't talk about, we have no time even to talk about what are wants, what are needs. I might have one, I, have, I might have a, a million dollar yacht. So, oh, that's my need. I need to cross the Atlantic. <laughs> so I need to have a private jet. I need to go somewhere. Is that a need or want? So there's so many layers and upon layers. And just one last thing, each societal community or nation will find one uh, of these principles of more of urgent need than the others, you know. Uh, say, um, you might find some countries where participation, part, uh, community participation is restricted, and that's the thing they need to, to work on. Maybe where the environment is degraded, that's what they need to work on. Or when there's always, even within communities, there are different um, things that need to be highlighted more than the others. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for listening to this boring <laughs> thing. And this is my gift to everybody who listened to me. I'm not offended when you, you sleep. You take a nap. Because I would do the same if I were listening to me. <laughs> but I always ask people, please don't snore. <laughs> no, I didn't want anybody to be on their toes, but I just say it. <laughs> Shall we pray? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we have spent together today. Help us to open ourselves to uh, promoting the human life and the common good and to see you in all our brothers and sisters. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.